Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. We are starting our weekend off right with watches, and everything you see is for sale. Reach out to me directly, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. I have full pricing information for all of these watches. Please note some of them are not listed on our website. Reach out to me directly, and I am looking to build inventory always buying, selling, and trading. If you're looking to sell or trade, reach out to me. Again, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. We will buy your watch, your entire collection. We pay cash, we pay fast, no upper limit on value paid. Your online concierge for all things watch, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. Delivering on the thumbnail immediately, we have the Omega Speedmaster Professional Moon Watch, and this is the Apollo 17th 45th anniversary timepiece. So, Launched in 2017, this watch is a stainless steel limited edition in a classical 42 millimeter moon watch case. Let's get a little bit closer right here. Take a close look at that dial because a lot of the action is right up front. The dial, as with the bezel insert, is blue ceramic. You can see there are a number of elements. Uh, the mascot of the mission inset within the constant second sub-register. And you can see that rather than having Arabic numeral 15 at the 15 second index. We have 17 just past it. You'll also note that this tachymeter starts at 450 rather than 500, and that is to represent 45 years since the final moon mission. Now, a couple of upscale features we have here, the ceramic bezel insert, yellow gold applique indices and matching hands. We have a sapphire crystal over the dial, and the timepiece features plenty of loom in spite of its opulent accoutrements. You can see that the timepiece still works as a moon watch. Now you can see the time, the mission lifted off to depart the moon for the final time. That is visible in GMT, 534 GMT up at the top of the dial. And a little bit of a period flourish that's been added. You can see there is this a checkered mark staggered around the seconds and minutes track that is the so-called racing dial famous from Omega Speedmasters of late 60s through mid 1970s. Turn it all over once again. You have the mission mascot. And on the reverse side of the watch, let me pop open the clasp here. This is a tribute to Gene Cernan, of course. Gene Cernan, Eugene Cernan, NASA astronaut and the leader of this mission. The timepiece features a individual numbering out of 1,972. Internally, it's a standard moon watch, caliber 1861, so Lamagna based cam lateral clutch, 48 hour manual wind power reserve. And the bracelet is impressive and imposing, including a 10 millimeter push button incremental adjustment for fine sizing. And you can see externally, it's a bit of a hybrid of a dress and a sports bracelet with a three link primary design. But then you've got these polished intermediate links and you have these oval cross section profiles so it does sort of tread between dress and sports styles and you can see it actually wears quite well with my shirt it's not a thin watch that will slide underneath some cuffs it might surprise you an easy watch to wear and quite comfortable if you've worn the moon watch you know exactly what to expect i recommend it for wrists as small as i would say 15 centimeters circumference on the bracelet 14 if you're going to wear it on a strap which you can certainly do this is a much sought model full of period mission and moon watch references. Now let's jump from sky high horology to high horology with my personal favorite, Debitune. You know them well. I've called out all of their virtues on this program before, but if you're new to the brand, founded in 2002, they make about 200 watches a year and they've built fewer than 3,000 timepieces since they were founded. In terms of technical innovations, original patents, and pure science research and development, they are second to none. This is a perpetual calendar, DB25 perpetual calendar. You can see that the watch features a solid dial and conventional lugs. So it's not like, for example, the DB28s and 27s, which tend to feature these floating lug designs. Uh, this is a much more conventional watch at face value, but it is technically impressive. 44 millimeters in diameter and rose gold. You can see that Debitune makes its own dials, cases, and movements. So all of this rose lathe guilloche, as well as the rose gold case construction, is original and proprietary. The watch has a lovely blue on silver print, and then we have an aperture style day and month with a pointer style date. It has a quick set. You have a leap year indicator inset next to a, a spherical moon phase. The moon phase has an adjustment interval of 1,112 years. The perpetual calendar does not need to be adjusted until the year 2100. Flipping it over. We can see a version of the in-house caliber 2024 automatic. We have a patented shock protection system for the rotor bearing. And then it is as much polar moment as you could possibly desire. The longest possible lever arm made of titanium and then a mass that is made of platinum. There's a little bit of sticker on the case back, nothing to worry about. So you get a tremendous turning force or polar moment. Now, 
taken a look. It's not just a shock protected rotor. We also have one, two, three shock protection springs on the balance, the better to resist damage, but also to recenter the balance staff for the sake of chronometry. No fewer than six patents protect the technologies found in this watch, so you're getting a lot of watchmaking for your money. And of course, you can see the balance, one of more than eight proprietary balance designs at Debatoon. It's made of titanium. It is non-annular. It's shaped like two crossed yokes, and it has platinum masses outboard again to maximize the polar moment and resistance to shock-induced timing deviation. Throw this watch on the wrist. My wrist is 16 centimeters circumference. And once again, you can see that the watch is broad, but not too big. I think you could wear this watch on a wrist as small as 15 centimeters circumference. And take note, it is very flat. It'll fit underneath a dress cuff. Now, if you want something bigger and sportier, the original Debitoon sports watch family was the DB20 family. This is the DB22, and it features the shingle shape that's common to these DB20 series watches. It's launched back in 2006. Now, the watch is a power reserve. Again, it's the automatic movement. Technically, it's identical to the other watch, but rather than a perpetual calendar, you can see here, we have a dial side power reserve. As the watch winds itself, or you wind it manually, the power reserve changes from red to black. The dial center features what's called micro light engraving, so it's reductive like guilloche, but it's not it's not cut on a rose lay the same way. Uh, guilloche on a watch like this would look incongruous. This is a very modern timepiece, technical, almost industrial in its aesthetic, and rose lay the guilloche as on a breguet would be a little bit of a sore thumb in an otherwise wonderfully ambitious modernist design. So they use the micro light. Now you can see there's some very subtle fired blue titanium on this dial. The bolts fixing the hour and minute ring, the hands at center. This firing process to blue titanium is patented by Debatoon. The watch is 200 meters water resistant, so if you're looking for a swimmable Debatoon timepiece, you have that here. Again, six days of power reserve, 200 meters water resistant, power reserve indicator, and it is large. This is nominally a 48 millimeter watch. It's about 52.5 millimeters from lug to lug, though it's only 11.3 millimeters thick. So it's really, it's a broad flat watch. And I'm going to let you judge whether this watch is too large for my wrist. Once again, my wrist is 16 centimeters. I think I could pull it off. But if your wrist is 17 centimeters circumference or larger, you have nothing to worry about. It's going to be a good fit. The case shape, if not the dial, the, for which De Batun is best known, is the DB28. Launched in 2010, it won the GPHG Egido, the Best Picture Award at the Oscars of Watchmaking, in 2011. And this model came out in 2014. It is the Digital. It is many things, but first and foremost, it is 45 millimeters in diameter in grade 5 titanium. It has variable geometry floating lugs, and then it has a screw-down crown, bullhead winder, 5-day power reserve, similar movement to what you saw before, but manual wind. We'll talk a bit more about the case back in a moment. Remember, Debitoon's making its cases, movements, and dials, so they make the fired blue titanium that creates the image of the cosmos around the moon at center, or the scale alongside the scrolling minutes, and they have a wonderful grand orge or barley corn guilloche pattern on the center dial and this is real guilloche not the stamped kind that you get at for example fp Jorn. taking a look at the moon phase you can see it's one half blued steel and one half white palladium and again it has that 1112 year adjustment interval around it we have a fire disc of titanium with little white gold planets and stars inserted so it would appear to be a little polished sections of the titanium are actually made of gold and inserted into slots in the dial. Now turn it over. You can see we have triple parachute shock protection, but in a different fashion than we saw earlier. The center brace for the shock protection system, as well as the balance bridge, made of fired blue titanium. And you can also appreciate the fact that here we have yet another patented balance design. This one, a solid disc of silicon, and then a white gold rim, maximizing the mass outboard and minimizing the mass inboard. Twin barrels, manual wind, you cannot accidentally overwind them. Now, if you look, you can see we have Cote de Batoon, similar to Cote de Genève, but the wheel that lays down these stripes is reversed on each side, which is why they appear to mirror each other rather than having a consistent gradient from one side to the other. And if you look carefully, you can also see that though avant-garde, these watches do feature traditional finish. The anglage is a mile wide and mirrored. Quite pleasing. We'll throw this watch on my wrist, once again, 16 centimeters in circumference, and it's comfortable. You can have the lug size changed at the factory. They have a short lug arrangement and a medium lug arrangement. You send this watch in for service. Let's say you get it on the long lugs, which we 
we have here, and you don't like it, you want it to be a bit more compact, when you send it in for service, ask for the short lugs, because they take your old lugs in exchange, they add the new set of lugs for free, so it's a very simple swap. Of course, this watch is a jump hour, hence digital. It is a wonderfully animated and engaging complication that makes it one of my favorite watches from Debitune. In case you're wondering, uh, yes, there is a quick set for the moon phase as well. Now, let's jump from Lauberson, where Debitune is based, to Glasuta, where we have Langa. This, of course, is the unconventional take on a Longa Unzona watchmaking. Uh, you might remember the arcade from the first four Longa watches launched in 1994. Well, this is the Cabaret, a bigger and burlier and bolder version of the watch. Not big, but bigger. This one is designed to be a unisex model, whereas the original arcade was a ladies' watch. So it's 26.6 millimeters from side to side, and then from lug to lug it's 42.7 millimeters. This one's in rose gold. As with most Longa watches, it features a dial made of sterling silver that's then galvanized black. On the reverse side, you can see the movement beautifully made as the longer movements tend to be caliber 931, 42 hour manual wine power reserve, German silver bridges and plates, freehand engraved balance cock. We have both black polished screws and fired blue screws here. And then you can see the details matter. There's not a lot of movement, but what's there is quite special. The anglage is broad, mirrored, and hand laid. We have a black polished cap for the escape wheel with a sharp interior angle, which is tough to pull off considering that component is made of steel, not. German silver, and then we have a black polished swan's neck fun adjustment system on that freehand engraved balance cocked Lasuta stripes. We have jewels set in chaton. That's an old fashioned way of making watches that dates back to the pocket watch era of watchmaking in Glasuta, and that's why it's used because they're paying tribute to their heritage. The watch is not too large, and as you can see, though, it wears larger uh, than you might suspect given its bare dimensions. Really think of it as a 39 millimeter round watch, and you get the basic idea. Uh, you could still wear this on a male or female wrist, and you can see the lugs are nowhere near either side of my wrist. We're not quite done with Omega. We had the Gene Cernan, and now here we have the latest caliber 3861 Moon Watch. Here in Sedna Gold, this is definitely a luxury model, though it's not a limited edition or a caliber 321 piece. This is caliber 3861. We may as well start with the case back. You can see it is the latest version of the Moon Watch caliber. Still distantly Lamagna based, but now we have quite a few changes. What doesn't change? Well, the Lamagna base, the cam lateral clutch arrangement and the manual winding almost everything else changes power reserve is now 50 hours not 48 we now have a free sprung balance rather than a mobile stud index we have a coaxial escapement rather than conventional swiss lever we have a silicon rather than ferrous hairspring so it's now highly anti-magnetic and it is a master chronometer and in good taste omega decided to put all of that information on the back of the watch so you can see it is a master chronometer it's gone through the Meta's test, it is a coaxial, but the dial doesn't change compared to the regular sapphire sandwich of the previous generation. Now here, as you can see, we do feature a sapphire on both sides and a little bit of an upscale look as we have applique indices. Uh, the dial has a little bit of a pent up center, so we have a dropped seconds and minutes track and then nicely dished sub registers. It's a good looking piece and it is more durable and more accurate than in the past as typically the moon watch was never chronometer certified. There were exceptions, but for the most part, that was not the case. Now you may be wondering, what is Sedna Gold? Well, you've heard of Hublot's King Gold and Rolex's Ever Rose, and the short answer is this is basically that. It is a high copper content 5N red gold that also has a high percentage of palladium to ward off fading or oxidation over time. Rose, pink, red gold can fade, but this formulation is designed not to do that. We'll do a quick loom shot here. Once again, when we have loomed watches, I always do my best to show you what they look like in the dark. Uh, it does have a loomed chronograph seconds hand, which I like because that makes it a more functional watch watch. This one's sure to be controversial. That said, there's no denying the artistry of this Rolex Oyster Perpetual Cosmograph Daytona 116588SACO. The watch features an extraordinary bezel with invisible setting of orange sapphires, which are graded by a laser scanner so that there is no color gradient from gem to gem. They are identical. The setting, dial, and bezel is done entirely by hand, making this one of the last 
truly handmade Rolex watches. Now it's yellow gold, 40 millimeters in diameter. It features tinted meteorite sub-registers, brilliant set gems on yellow gold indices on a dial of black lacquer, and it is very, very special. It's also equipped with the Oyster Flex strap bracelet. I call it that because internally it is a titanium nickel alloy. You can't actually cut it, which is why they have several different sizes. And then inside the clasp, you could see there is an easy link, five millimeter, tool free adjustment system, as well as some little divots drilled inside the clasp so you can use your strap tool to change the anchoring point of the uh, strap within the clasp. It is a very secure system. The watch has a three-day automatic winding power reserve. It is chronometer certified. This 2019 release is actually tested at the factory as a fully cased up watch. The bare movement is COSC certified, but the watch is then tested in six positions, fully assembled, to ensure it runs no worse than plus two, minus two seconds per day. That is the substantive basis for Rolex's claim to that term superlative chronometer on the dial. Now it is shock resistant, anti-magnetic, screw down crowns and pushers, 100 meters water resistant, and it's not as big as it looks. It looks huge because of its standout color and gems. I'll throw it on my wrist though, and you can see that this is actually a watch that you can fit underneath the cuff. While it's a bit bombastic in detail, it's actually quite graceful in form, and you can see that Daytona case, probably most similar to a Datejust, a Daydate, or even a Yachtmaster. This is not the so-called super case that you see on the GMT's Explorer 2s and the dive watches. It's a good-looking watch. It is very bold, though, so you better have a personality to match. This is not for a shy man. That said, I've got a colorful Rolex of perhaps greater discretion. The Milgauss and this one is the GV. Now, when the Milgauss came back as reference 116400 in 2007, this was the watch that immediately had the longest wait list. Tinted green sapphire crystal. You actually have this yellowish orange loom used on the indices, and then straight up orange for the lightning bolt second hand and the Arabic numerals every five minutes on the dial. The dial base, unlike most Rolex watches, it's actually not gloss lacquer. It is matte, which creates a very different look. And in case you're wondering, why don't I see the little crown at 6 o'clock that's not included on the GV crystals? Precisely because it would be visible all the time on this model. Now, the timepiece features that lightning bolt seconds hand from reference 6541 back in the 50s. So while it seems a little bit postmodern and orange, it is very much historically correct. Back in the stolid and sober 1950s, when Rolex was working with high energy technicians and engineers to create an anti-magnetic watch, they had that silly lightning bolt on there to remind them perhaps not to take themselves so seriously at the height of the Cold War. Or maybe they just thought it looked cool. Now the watch itself is 40 millimeters in diameter. It is highly anti-magnetic. It has an anti-magnetic escapement, an anti-magnetic niobium zirconium, blue oxidized hairspring, and it does have an iron cage around the movement, front and back. And so while the original would have been 1000 Gauss or middle Gauss anti-magnetic, I strongly suspect that with the addition of the escapement and the hairspring on this model, it is considerably more than mil Gauss. The watch of course does feature a chronometer grade movement and a 48-hour power reserve. We'll turn the lights out. You get a good sense of it. You see, this is chromolite blue loom. It's Rolex's proprietary loom. It looks great. It glows bright. And if you've ever wondered about 24-hour endurance, that is, the watch that glows at 8 p.m., does it still glow at 4 a.m.? With this loom, the answer is yes. It also looks great on a smaller wrist. Now, whenever we speak of Rolex, emulators come to attention and come to mind. And that's exactly what we have here. Let's be perfectly honest here. This watch was designed to gloam onto the popularity of the Cosmograph Daytona. That said, it offers features that the Daytona does not. And particularly when you look at it from case angles that show the lugs and the case profile, it really comes into its own as a standalone design. So let's talk a little bit about the standout feature of the watch that is not the way it looks. We're talking about the striking 10th. It's a Foudreon system that was originally launched back in 2010. The idea being to take one second of chronograph time and spread it out over roughly 36 degrees of the dial. And the the idea there is that it's hard to read one-tenth of a second when you're viewing little hash marks. It is much easier to read one-tenth of a second when you are dealing with large expanses and big scales. So for example, I can see that this is two seconds on the nose 
and that is two seconds and four tenths. It just makes it easier to read fractions of a second, thus availing of the potential accuracy of the 10 beat per second El Primero. Now we have a ceramic foudron scale for the striking tenth on the bezel, and that helps to guard the case from scratches. It's a push-down crown, but the watch is 100 meters water resistant. The most distinctively zenith parts of the watch are the movement, the lug profile, and then the center dial, where you have that 1969 A386 tricolor overlap. Now, you do lose the chronograph hours indicator. We have uh, fractions of seconds, we have 60 seconds, we have 60 minutes, and I actually like that the chronograph minutes register goes up to 60. It's not a 30-minute register. That makes it more practical to me. A feature not previously available on non-day 21 L Primero movements is this hacking seconds function and then you do have a quick set for the date let's do a quick loom shot here plenty of loom no issues there and the watch is actually quite compact from lug to lug. It's 46.5 millimeters lug to lug, so it wears a little bit smaller than you might guess for a 41 millimeter timepiece. Throwing it on my wrist, it looks good, it feels good. You can get a strap, please get it on the bracelet. No point in buying the bracelet as an accessory. That would be expensive, whereas you can buy the strap relatively cheaply if you want to dress this one down or change the look or alter the fit. Now, on the reverse side, you can see what is effectively the second generation El Primero took long enough. It appeared in 2019, which was the 50th anniversary of the El Primero movement. Scalibur 3600, big changes. Hacking seconds is one, and then the extra 10 hours of power reserve for 60 total is the other. It's still lateral clutch, column wheel chrono, still blazes away at 36,000 vibrations per hour. Now, if it's on 35 joules rather than the original 31, you can see the lateral clutch is big, beautiful, and readily apparent. Not so apparent is the use of a silicon hairspring or rather, silicon escapement, pardon, uh, to reduce the need for lubrication. So the silicon escapement is low friction and never needs to be re-lubricated. So that actually helps to increase the intervals between service, but also improves the performance of the watch in between services. There's no big drop-off after, for example, 18 or 24 months. Now, continuing with our theme of relatively accessible, a stainless steel full bracelet watches here. We have from Grand Seiko the Spring Drive SBGA 471, an absolutely gorgeous satin finished light blue sky blue dial inside the 44GS case. This one has been Zeratsu black polished that's held against a spinning tin wheel by an artisan who takes about three years to master this hand polishing technique. It's something that sets these watches apart as you will not find extensive hand finishing on a Swiss watch of this price. This one gives you a hand-finished case, a watchmaker assembled and regulated movement, and then the dial furniture is the standout. As you can see, the logo, the frame for the date, the individual indices, and the hands at center have this wonderful gem-like faceting and the break between the planes of the polished surfaces. And all of that is created manually on diamond-tipped micro milling tools. The hand at center is actually fired blue steel and it has a completely smooth sweep. That is spring drive technology. There's no jump, there's no stagger, there is no tick-tock. It is not a Swiss lever. It uses a unidirectional governing wheel. All of the energy is derived from the spring. All of the motion is by mechanical means. There are no motors, there are no capacitors, there are no batteries, but it does have a quartz oscillator that wakes up as the unidirectional wheel creates an induced electrical current, the quartz oscillator then uses an electromagnetic braking force to slow this wheel, and that helps to ensure accuracy of plus or minus 15 seconds per month. The watch does have hacking seconds and a quick set date, and there's a power reserve indicator on the dial to keep track of the three days of power reserve. Throw it on the wrist. Fits nicely, fairly flat fairly narrow across the wrist. This is a unisex option. I'd recommend it for ladies as well as for men. Okay, so high horology full bracelet steel sports watches. Well, for that, we have Moser. You were expecting AP, maybe Patek Philippe. Those are played out. I like them just fine, but I like this better, and there's a couple of reasons. First, Moser realized when they launched this watch in 2020 that it's good to reference an era, not so much to plagiarize a specific designer or model. As a result, we have a tonneau case that's redolent of the 70s with a lovely lapping machine, radial grain brushed onto the bezel. We have an integrated bracelet with an almost organic interlock of links. So here we have maybe 
One could say uh, the look of a 70s tonneau style chronograph like the later Omega Mark series or perhaps the Oris Chronoris Star. We have a staggered racing dial, checker mark outboard, much like you would have found on Omega Chronos at the time. The bracelet has a little bit of Omega Speed Sonic chronograph lobster tail, but also a little bit of Ebel Sport Classic from the late 1970s. So there are a lot of references here, but it's not literal. You don't look at this watch and say, oh, that's the Royal Oak or oh, that's the Nautilus or clearly they cribbed Gerald Genta. They didn't. The watch manages to be its own thing. Now, the perpetual calendar and the chronograph versions of this watch are quite large. This one at 40 millimeters by 12 millimeters thick is much more wearable for me on a wrist of my size. Also, you could see that the watch has a lovely matrix green Fumé dial. Fumé at Moser means a fade. So from bright matrix green at the center to dark at the edge, you can see those lovely applique polished indices. It really is a special looking timepiece. Everything about it pops on the wrist. And you can see it is flat enough. If you wanted to wear it under a sleeve, you could. And it has the sports watch chops being automatic winding, stainless steel, full bracelet, and 120 meters water resistant. They use a loom that they call Globo Light on the hands. It's actually a Loom impregnated ceramic material. And the attention to detail is superb. As you can see, the individual indices actually echo the shape of the loom inserts on the hands, as well as the underlying hands. Minimal branding, H. Moser and C. They don't even print Swiss made on their watch because they know their watches are 90% Swiss, whereas the standard for Swiss made is 60% Swiss. Turn it all over, HMC 200 movement. It does have hacking seconds, bi directional winding, a full balance bridge with a free sprung index for toughness, and a 72 two-hour power reserve, and this is a very special watch, a real strong effort from Moser. Remember, they're making between 1,500 and 2,000 watches a year, so Patek is making more like 60,000, and they will make far more Aquanauts and Nautili than Moser will make Streamliner Center Seconds. This would be my easy choice. Also, they continue the Moser tradition of evacuated case flanks with this hollow recess on each side, a really well-considered design that fits as good as it looks. So here we have two from uh, two different eras at FP Journe. This first era, eras didn't last that long back in 2019 because this was a one-year watch. This was a watch launched in 2019 as a send-off for the old model of the Resonance. This is known as the 2019 model. By chronology, it should be called the Res 4, but it's not called the Resonance 4. Sometimes it's called the 2019 or the Anniversary, which strictly speaking it isn't, but press the I Believe button. Uh, the Anniversary came the next year. Here we have symmetrical dials, so it goes back to the Resonance 1 symmetrical form rather than, or I guess you could say, it goes back to the Resonance 1 and 2 symmetrical form and it dodges the Resonance 3's scrolling time display. A lot of folks didn't like that. I actually think that's going to wind up being very collectible, but for now it seems like people like the symmetrical dials, and this model specifically is super collectible, not just because it was made for just one year, because it uses blue printing on the dials, which is always indicative of a special series at Jorn. And this is the boutique exclusive version of the one-year model. You can see it has the black dial in the rose gold case that is exclusive to those watches sold through FP Jorn boutiques with the boutique trim package. Now, of course, it is a resonance, but you can set the time zones independently in 24 and 12 hour format. So it is functional as a dual time watch. Now turn it all over, you can see the movement is made of solid gold. So the case is gold and then the movement's gold. 42 hour power reserve, both sides independent. We have separate barrels, drivetrains, escapements, and balances. And by judicious adjustment, you can get them to resonate. That is beat in opposition. And I'll see if I can get it going right here. When they're beating in opposition, if one slows down, the other will correct it by an equal and opposite margin. So not only do they stay coupled together to the tune of five seconds or less per 24 hours, but it is a self-correcting chronometer with each side free sprung and adjusted in six positions. Because it takes seven to 10 minutes for resonance to effectively gain purchase on the two balances, you might wind up with seconds hands that are not synchronized. So you after remember, wait seven to 10 minutes, you synchronize by pulling the flyback mechanism down at four o'clock. Okay, so that's cool. Some who are really techy might find this even cooler. This truly is the 20th anniversary design. The Resonance, as it was re-released 
for 2020. This is a 40 millimeter case. You can also get it in 42, but this is a 40 in platinum with a white gold dial. You could see a skeletonized center that actually represents the differential whereby the now single barrel distributes energy equal to each separate drivetrain. For 28 hours of the 42 hours of power reserve, two independent remontoir de galette constant force devices meet out equal amounts of energy to the two balances so for 28 hours they maintain constant amplitude the idea being that you wind this watch every day using the now two o'clock mounted crown and trust me it's a heck of a lot easier than the old bullhead winder but as long as you wind this watch every 24 hours the balances will maintain constant amplitude so the watch will be a better timekeeper now we again have the 2412 split. We don't have calibrations on the power reserve now. It's been muted and it's a bit more understated. On the reverse side, you can see the movement is much more complex, but just as beautiful. And if I do say so myself, the finishing, particularly the beveling on Journe watches, has been getting better in recent years. It used to be quite obviously mechanical. They do a better job of disguising the mechanized portions of the fabrication process these days. And yes, this one also features the flyback system for the second hands, which is just fun to play with, to be perfectly honest. I debated whether to make this the last watch, but because I like things in series, I'm going to present this with the other Jorns. This is a 99-piece, 40-millimeter platinum 2019 special edition for Dubai to celebrate the opening of F.P. Jorn's first brand boutique, and it was in the Dubai Mall. Now, the watch is a little bit of a fusion of the Chronomet Bleu and the Chronomet Souverain. So it has the 40-millimeter case size of the Souverain. It has the three-hand, no-power reserve dial of the Bleu, but it is a very different watch. As you can see, everything from this model-specific leather strap to the green lacquer dial with applique matte white gold numerals. It is specific to this model. The dial is lacquered green, beautiful, glossy. It has the twinkling character of enamel, and it gives the impression of perpetually wet paint. Now, a chronomet blue will feature printed numerals. Here, you can see they are three-dimensional blocks of white gold, but rather than being satinated, that is brushed or polished, they have a wonderful media-blasted matte finish that's echoed on the hands turn it all over and you can see it's the caliber 1304 that you'll find on the chronomet souverain and it even says so on the base plate but it's designed for chronometry. Now, this was the best men's watch winner at the 2005 GPHG. The original Chronomet Souverain was with this caliber 1304. Uh, the movement, of course, is made of solid gold. We have two barrels with a 56-hour power reserve. There are many refinements here to make the watch extremely accurate, starting with twin barrels, which ensure a more even torque release over the full span of power reserve, so you don't have big amplitude drop-off after 24 hours, for example. Six position adjustment rather than the five position you find on chronometers, and then a very large balance wheel with a free sprung index. So a lot of features here to make this watch accurate and durable. And you can see there's a hidden drivetrain. As you can see the barrels, you can see the escapement. You can't actually see the drivetrain between them because it's hidden underneath the dial. Lots to love. We have Cote de Genève, we have mirrored anglage, black polished screws, satinated regulator, uh, that is cap for the stud holder, I should say. We have engine turned perlage on the base plate and two sides, a lovely sunray motif flanking the barrels. There is a lot to beguile the eye and warrant the ownership of a loop when you buy this watch. We'll throw it on my wrist. It is super slim, being essentially just like the Chronomet Bleu. It disappears under a cuff. It's a good-looking watch. For him or for her, it's definitely a unisex option with a 48-millimeter lug-to-lug span and a 40-millimeter case diameter. Okay. Alangu Unzona. Richard Langa Perpetual Calendar Terra Luna, launched back in 2014 and an absolute monolith, monstrous in white gold, 45.5 millimeters, but frankly, it's not oversized for the sake of style or bombast, but simply because they packed so much into it. Let's take a look at the dial. 
The first thing you'll note is this is not a Venn diagram. This is a Johann Seyfert scale. So we have the triple overlap. We have a regulator dial with separate hours, minutes, and seconds. Note the hacking seconds. Power reserve indicator scrolling down at the base of the dial. In case you're wondering, 14 days of power reserve. Instantaneous jumping perpetual calendar with a panorama datum or the outsized date that is a signature of Longa. And you'll appreciate the fact that it is a very intuitive calendar to read as you have your leap year phase, your date, you have your day, and you have your month. Turn it all over, and well, things get crazy. You could argue that this was Longa's first celestial watch, because on the reverse side, the position of the sun is represented by the balance wheel. The Earth rotates on its axis, and not only does the moon change phase, but it orbits the Earth. Now, if you're very good with spatial reasoning and you have sharp eyes, you'll note that this northern hemisphere projection of the Earth actually does have 24 time zones and that there is a 24-hour scale outboard. So if you set it and again, you have good eyes. You can actually use this as a world time indicator. There is a remontoir de galette, much as it is found in the Zeitwerk, based on a double third wheel with a hairspring in between them. So every minute, energy is transferred from the mainsprings, which have enormous energy and torque, to the escapement. If the springs were to drive the escapement directly, you would get knocking. That is, the balance goes all the way around and actually hits the jewels of the lever. So in order to maintain constant amplitude, maximize timing precision, and avoid knocking, they use this remontoir system. So it's not going to overdrive the escapement when it's fully wound, nor is it going to lose a ton of time when it's down to four, three, two days of power reserve remaining. And I guess I may as well show you a little bit of how this case back works. There are systems built in that allow you to set the time zones uh, of the Earth and then the moon phase uh, independently. So basically you can set the phase of the moon, the position of the moon, and the time zone of the Earth independently. And all of that is done through a combination of the crown, the pushers, and then the uh, individual trigger. You see, I can't actually use it when the crown is set in. And that is a trigger for the sake of safety, so I cannot accidentally set the perpetual calendar. I have to take measures like withdrawing the crown in order to set the calendar system. And of course, it's a perpetual calendar, which means it can deal with a regular length, months, and leap years. And it has Longa's most deluxe clasp, this originally designed for the Longa 31. It has a deployant action. Most Longa watches only have pin buckles. And it has a twin trigger release. Most Longa deployant clasps are just friction fit open it up inside, and you can see that it actually features a deployant lock. So you can slide the strap through and then lock it in place so you have an extra level of security. The watch is huge. Once again, it's 17 millimeters thick, and it's 45.5 millimeters in diameter. I believe you need a wrist. You might think it fits on my wrist, and you probably wouldn't be wrong, but I'd say you need a wrist of 17 centimeters circumference or an abundant appreciation of how much they're fitting into this case in order to wear this watch well. You're going to appreciate the, the mechanism and consider it to be a very compact high complication if you're into the tech, or you're just going to consider it to be a very striking and strident statement of East German high horology if you're just into the look. And there is no right or wrong way to enjoy this watch. Just know this, it will always be rare and you will probably never see another one. Reach out to me, tmasso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details of any watch you see on this show. Timeout, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.